at Ephesians uh, chapter, <clears throat> what did I say, Ephesians chapter 4 tonight. I uh, was praying uh, earlier about uh, what to preach on tonight, and last night I studied some things out, and I went there. That's what I'm going to do. And when I sat myself down to go back over it again, I just like the Holy Ghost to say, no, it wasn't. That wasn't it at all. And so uh, sometimes I will look for the easy way out uh, instead of what God wants. That's my nature, but uh, just try to follow the Lord. So I wrestled with him for a while. And um, now what I want to do is I mentioned some things this morning about the body and us being joined together. And you see that in uh, verse 15 and, and well, let's, we can pick it up in verse 14, verse 13 actually, talking about unity. But verse 14, really, let's pick it up because let's just say that uh, from verse 14, we, uh, we're like you're newly brought in to the Lord. You've just been newly saved, and uh, you're, you're a child of the King, and you're a, a, a baby in the Lord, and, and now you're not part of the, the wicked crowd of the world. You're not doing the things that the world's doing anymore, or you don't want to do those things. And uh, you're certainly not, as he says here in verse 14, tossed to and fro or carried about with every wind of doctrine. There's, there's those uh, in church, those who, say, who are saved, that fall in one of two categories. Either A, they cared absolutely nothing about any kind of religion whatsoever, uh, but they chased a lot of sin. And when they come to the Lord, religion and, and a religious... And by the way, we are... This is a religion. I don't like those people who are trying to put off to the lost world. Oh, we're not talking about religion. That's, that's being dishonest with people. I really think that. I think it's being dishonest. You're trying to deceive them by making them think that it's not religion. And yet the moment you mention God, that's religion. Because there is a good religion. Pure religion and undefiled, the Bible talks about. And so I just, don't, I just don't like the tactics. Tactics that I was taught at one time. I don't like those tactics. I don't think we ought to mislead anybody. I don't think we ought to be dishonest with people. I don't think we ought to try to cover up anything that we're trying to do. I think if you're there to talk to somebody about the Lord, I mean, you can talk about fishing and hunting all you want to, but just be honest and say, look, we came here to talk to you about your soul. Now, if that's going to get us thrown out, at least on our way out, give us a moment to tell you about Jesus Christ. Okay? But if that's not, if you're going to listen to us, if you'll give us five or ten minutes, we'll tell you why we came. So anyway, but there, then, there's, then the, you know, there's those that knew no religion, and they come and, and they want to learn how to live for Christ. And then, there's others, though, that have been part of other religions. They may have been a Roman Catholic. They may have been... Uh, like uh, Bradley was. He was a Mormon. And he had to relearn some things. Brady was Job's witness. Had to relearn some things. Uh, people come from uh, New Age ideologies. Or they come from some far, far Eastern mysticism, Hinduism, things like that. Uh, or like with some of the people that followed us. They, they tell me, Pastor, we, we, we were part of this movement for a while. Then we were part of that movement for a while. Then we did this for a while. And we did that for a while, and Pastor, we're here to tell you that once we figured out where the Bible was, and God has set us straight, we're here to stay. We're going to stick with the Word of God. And I hope that that's true. I really hope that that's true. I hope that these people are still, they're no longer children tossed to and fro. Because if that's the case then, then we're just the next step to oblivion for them because they're going to go from here and go some off wild some wild other place somewhere else and still being blown around. So verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There's people there's evil people out there that are just trying to deceive uh, all they care about is deceiving. That's all they care about is the money that they're going to get from that. And I don't care if it's a, I don't care if it's a big mega church or a YouTube following with a fifty thousand subscribers because they're going to get paid for that. And they're just lying away to deceit because they know they're going to get paid for it. So there are people out there who have just been blown around from one doctrinal idea to another. Hopefully. 
Those that have settled here, your faith has found a resting place. Not in us, not in Bethel Church, but in the Word of God. So verse 15. From this point forward, now that you're saved, from this point forward, no more tossed around. No more children. You've decided, I'm going to grow up. It's time for me to grow up. But now, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ. Now let me just touch on one thing here, verse 15. Just because you spoke the truth, that doesn't mean you did it in love. And I, I've known, I've heard a lot of different preachers over the years. And there are, there are certain preachers who for the sheer idea that they spoke the truth, well, obviously I love them. I told them the truth, didn't I? You can tell somebody the truth and, and hate their guts and hope they never come to it. And those, they'll pick up on that. If we're going to tell somebody the truth, we have to do it because we love them enough to want to know the truth and have the truth make them free so that they will be part of what God has made us a part of. To be honest with you, some people want you to know the truth so you'll just keep scooting right on out that door and you'll just go somewhere else. Okay? That to me, that has, there's no truth. And there's no love in that. There's no Christianity in that either. Amen? So we speak the truth in love. Verse 16. And this is that idea about the body. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. If you tell them the truth because you want to see them grow, you want to see God's people grow in love with one another, you want to see them grow in love, be nurtured, be edified, and be blessed, then there's a good thing in that. So then he says, verse 17, and I want you to look up on the screen here. I have nothing on the screen. I haven't done this in a while. I didn't forget, though. So we're just going down verse by verse, okay? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, see that word, henceforth, Let's say that you just came to the Lord. Or let's say that you came a year ago. Or let's say you came to the Lord years ago, but you haven't been taught. Okay? There's all kinds of reasons why you may not be doing certain things right. Maybe because you're new. Maybe because uh, you haven't been taught well. Okay? But from hence forth, from this point forward, there's got to be a change in your life. You're not going to walk as other Gentiles walk. You can underline that. as that, That's what we're going to talk about. Okay? In other words, if I, if I preach on, if I preach on, um, oh, I'm going to preach on having a dirty mouth. Okay? Well, there may be somebody here, maybe somebody listening, that up until then, they've had a dirty mouth. And they've never, they've never, I haven't said anything about it, they've never heard anything about it. The Holy Ghost hasn't worked on them yet, and so they've just been running around telling everybody they're saved, but they got a dirty mouth. And what we say now is, from henceforth, now that you know that that's wrong, you just determine in your heart, from henceforth, I'm not going to have a dirty mouth. Okay? Or somebody has been, they've been, you know, they drink a little bit, have a little wine cooler in their basement. They drink a little wine when they have family get-togethers in. They've never been taught that that's wrong. They've never been heard because as far as American society goes, there's nothing wrong with that. Have a little beer in the fridge every now and then, okay? And they didn't know they was doing anything wrong until all of a sudden they heard something about it. And they're what? What? Is this wrong? Hear the preacher talk about it. Hear the preacher preach a message on it. Or they read something in the Bible that talks about it or whatever. They say, wait a minute, is that wrong? They, they call the preacher or call somebody. Is it, you know, do you think it's wrong? You know, I, I'm just new to this. I don't know all these things. Okay, from henceforth now, you're not going to put the bottle to your lips from henceforth. You, once you know about it, we're not going to do that again, are we? Okay? It's just like with these children. They don't know everything that we know about what's right and what's wrong. That's why they have to be trained. 
And so every now and then they'll do something. They'll do something wrong. And we want to be mad at them, but we're going, well, how were they supposed to know that was wrong? How were they supposed to know they weren't supposed to do that? I haven't taught them that yet. Okay, mommy won't whip you this time. But from now on, you know that that's wrong. And I don't want to ever see you or know about you doing that again. So from that point forward, you have to lay down a rule that says, now that you know this is wrong, I don't want to see this again. This is not going to be part of your life ever again. From henceforth, from henceforth, we walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And so this could be day one of you being a Christian. This could be day 500 of you being a Christian. But there's some things that we all have to learn that if we're going to be part of this body of Christ, if we're going to love one another, if, if you want God, I talk about God's mercy. I just think people need to know about God's mercy. Amen. God has a, God is rich in mercy. He is ever forgiven. God is great in his mercy toward us, right? But you've got to be convicted that it's wrong. Because to keep doing something over and over and over again and then not be convicted or not, not even, even if you're told that it's wrong, even if somebody shows it to you in the Bible, but you don't think it's wrong, there's no forgiveness for that. There's no mercy for that. For you to willfully just keep doing something in God's face. God, the Holy Ghost telling you that it's wrong, but I don't believe it's wrong. Uh, there's not a whole lot of mercy left on you. God's going to try maybe a few times to correct you and to see if we can get you out of this mindset that what you're doing is okay because God said it's not. So there's no mercy for that. But for those who come to the Lord, apology, repentance or whatever, God has mercy on them. So he says, uh, verse 18, this is the Gentiles. He's talking about verse 17. Having the understanding darkened. Being alien. No, so, so first of all, your understanding is darkened. If you keep on in these things, even after being taught, number one, your understanding is darkened. Number two, you are either willfully or ignorantly alienating yourself from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. So, we're, and we're talking about the, the Gentiles, we're talking about wicked people. Sure, they don't know what it takes to be a Christian. Sure, they don't know what life is like on the, on the inside of a church. They don't know anything about that. I tell you, I've, I've, done, I've dealt with people, uh, especially when it comes to funerals and marriages. I'll be having a, a marriage in here, and in the marriage practice, I have to tell people, now gentlemen, take your caps off, we're in the house of God. You know, that's a little thing. Then I have to tell them, uh, excuse me, but the Budweiser t-shirt, I don't want to see that tomorrow. This is the house of God. Oh, okay. But then I've had to say, in the, in the wedding rehearsal, excuse me, this is the house of the Lord. Would you not be using the B word, the F word, and the D word, and the S word here in the, ho in the house of God? And then, one time, right after the wedding ceremony, a guy, he was a Navy, he was a Navy guy, he did something up there. I think he was pulling the little deal down. And he stuck a nail in his finger. And I mean every word that they give you in the Navy. He said, no, he said, oh, he didn't say a lot of them. He said every one of them repeatedly down here. And I'm just going. <sighs> okay, I get it. He has his understanding darkened. And he has alienated himself from the life of God through ignorance. Okay, I get that. But once you come to the Lord, once you have said, God, I want to follow you. Christ, I want to follow you. After a while, it, there's not a lot of forbearance on you. If you've sat in the same church services that everybody else has sat in, and you've heard the same preaching that everybody else has heard, and you've been taught the same lessons everybody else has heard, and that preacher has dealt with sin and dealt with issues and dealt with things, and you keep doing them, then it sounds more like that you still have your understanding darkened rather than having the light of the Word of God shine in you. 
it still sounds like that you're still living a life alienated from God instead of a life that's drawing yourself toward God. Because things were taught to you and you're still doing them willingly, willfully, not repenting of them. Don't feel bad about it. You're still doing it. Sounds like to me there's not a lot of evidence that there really was salvation there to begin with. But after you come to true salvation, when you get saved, don't you, don't you want to do this thing right? Don't you want to live for the Lord? Don't you want to please Him? Don't you want to honor Him? Don't you want to be a living testimony to a lost and dying world about out there about what it is to be a Christian? Don't you want to show forth these wonderful things out of the Word of God about how it is we're supposed to live? Amen. So that's what he's saying here. They have their understanding darkened. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their own heart. That, to me, does not describe someone who is truly a born-again Christian wanting to live the life. Verse 19, here's another way to describe them. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to walk, to work all in cleanness with greediness. That's not a Christian. That's not a saved person. That's, that's not a pastor. That's not a pastor who wants to lead his congregation to a thrice holy God. That's not... The adults in a church who want to lead the children and the young people to a life of holiness, to avoid the mistakes that we may have made when we were lost, that's not what that sounds like to me. When you're past feeling, when you give up feeling and caring about who you please anymore and who you make happy anymore, to me, I'm not seeing the evidence and the fruit that someone is truly born again, even if they're just a new Christian. There's going to be some fruit there. They've given their lives over to, to lasciviousness to work all clean, uncleanness with greediness. These are, these are things that should differentiate us from lost people. Okay? So now, verse 20, here's where he's going to get to it. He said, but ye have not so learned Christ. Christ is not going to tell you that it's okay for you to use every word in the book out in front of your lost friends as long as you're going to tell them about Jesus at the end. Because we live in a society right now, uh, the mindset amongst the churches is be like the world, live like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, drink like the world, tell dirty jokes like the world, and be in lasciviousness like the world so that we can win the world for Jesus. Obviously, their Jesus does not do in them what our Jesus does in us. And it's not a boast. I'm not bragging about how we live. What I'm saying is God puts in us a new nature that we want, out of, we want all the way out of these things. Not just, I don't want the guilt and condemnation anymore. If that's all you want, then all you need to do is get your conscience here with a hot iron so you don't feel guilty about what you're doing anymore. But what we want is a life that is 180 degrees different than where it was when we came to Christ. I want a different life. I want a different lifestyle. I, want my, I, want, I don't want that sin to ever come around me ever again. I don't like what it did to me the first time. I'm not about to go back to it. Okay? So this is what we learn when we learn Christ. When we learn Jesus Christ... We learn that we're going to come out of these things. We're not going to continue in them and just be like the world. And I, I, I'm just, I'm getting to where I'm not stunned and amazed anymore when people send me stuff in the email or the mail about what their church in their neighborhood is doing anymore. I'm just not, I'm not stunned anymore like I used to be. And I haven't talked about these things in a long time because there's a lot of evil to talk about. And it just gets to me, I just... Several years ago, I started seeing what the churches were doing, and I'm going, Ooh, why are they doing this? And now I'm going, well, of course they're going to do this. They got the wrong Bible. Okay? So, verse 21, let me go down. There's a list here. I like these lists in the Bible. There's one after another that just hits you with things that you ought not be doing. So he says, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, number one. Here's what you do. Number one, you put off the 
concerning the former conversation, the old man. Put off the old man. Not you, Sterling. Okay? The old Sterling. The Sterling before you got saved. The Sterling, I didn't know him back then. I wasn't born yet. But when he got saved, I do know some things just from what he's told me, what Lisa's told me. Before he got saved, him and Gloria lived a certain lifestyle. But after they got saved, they didn't see the need of continuing on in that lifestyle. They started, they got in church, got Lisa in church, and it was just a church down the road. That's where they started going. That's where they went. And God started teaching them some things. And there was just things that, after over a while, Sterling and Gloria said, this is not who we are anymore. We don't do those things anymore. Okay? Now, I've been around them for the last, well, since 1980, I've known you, but I've been around you for the last 30 years. And I'm just telling you, there's a certain way that this man lives and a certain way he's not going to live anymore that he used to live. Okay? He's put that off. That's, he, some guys that knew him 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago may, know that, may have known that about him then. They don't know that about him now. Okay? He's just not that way anymore. So you put off that old conversation, the old man. You get rid of the old man, who, and he's the one that is corrupt according to deceitful lust. He's not going to try to corrupt anymore. He doesn't want his family corrupted. He doesn't want his church corrupted. He doesn't want his pastor corrupted. He wants things that are clean and that are right before God. First thing, get ready to get rid of the old man. Number two, uh, verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Write that down somewhere. Your mind is the battleground. It is where the devil, what is this phrase, an idle mind is what? The devil's playground. You better believe it is. When your mind is busy working, when your mind is busy studying, when your mind is busy doing chores or whatever it is, your mind's too busy to be messing around and playing in the devil's play yard. Okay? One of the corrupt, listen, the devil knows how to ruin a country. This may sound political, but you trace it down. From the moment we started, as, as a government, we started giving free money away to people so they would not have to earn a living for themselves, we started destroying this nation. That's not a Republican speech. That is a Bible Christianity speech. Because an idle mind is the devil's playground. And you have how many people who are now full-time government money wasters? They had, a, they had a couple on at Live PD the other night. I was watching them. The police pulled up to both of them. They both had drugs in their pocket. They both of them had government checks that they hadn't cashed yet. And they both were carrying around in their wallets over two grand a piece in cash. Neither one of them worked. They both got welfare checks or whatever kind of checks from the government. How did they spend their time? They spent their time buying or dealing in drugs or dealing in prostitution because this woman had the past that goes along with that. Not judging, I'm just telling you what a rap sheet said. And they both had wads of cash, and neither one of them was too busy to go out and get involved in some kind of nonsense. In other words, they didn't have jobs. You work a man to death all day long for 10 to 12 hours a day, and he's too tired to go out bar hopping all night long. It is the truth. We don't, we don't hear stuff like that anymore, but that's because we got so many people on government money. Okay? And so, you've got to be renewed in, that, in your mind on that deal. You've got to be renewed in your spirit. You've got to have your mind reshaped and reworked. Because anybody who has that much time on their hands is not going to try to figure out how they can spend all of that time for Jesus. It's the truth. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So, whatever it was that led you to the point where you wanted to be saved, 
That's how you need to go back and have the, your mind reworked so you don't end up back there again. Verse 24. Put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There are several things that are key here. Number one, it's a new man. It's not an old man in new clothes. Number two, you cannot create it yourself. God must create it. If God doesn't create it, you're wasting your time. There is no self-help when it comes to sin. There's no self-help manual for this. Okay? Number three, if it's not righteous and truly holy, then God didn't create it and it's not new. Okay? Verse 25. I'm going to get done with this fairly quick. You're going to be so happy with me. But this is just easy stuff. Verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying. Put that on your list. Quit your lying. Quit lying to everybody in church. Quit lying to everybody in your family. Quit lying to yourself. Quit lying to yourself about who you are. Wherefore, putting away all lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Because your neighbors always know, don't they? Because they saw your trash can tipped over. They know what you've been doing all week. Because of the trash you threw away. You can try to cover some of that stuff up if you want with other garbage. But with the dog, and God will always find a dog somewhere to knock your trash can over. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Roland. Your trash can's next, buddy. Putting away a line. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. If you can't love your neighbor enough to live God's life in front of them then there's only two commandments we've been given. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can't love your neighbor enough to put away all this nonsense and be honest in front of your neighbor, if you don't love them enough, then half of you ain't right with God and I suspect the other half isn't either. Verse 26. Here we go. Be angry. And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, there's something to be said about a man or a woman who can truly control their temper. Lie not with your tongue. Lie not with your actions and your deeds and your vengeance. He did not say, don't be angry. That's impossible. God gets angry. God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says. But to be able to control your tongue and control your vengeance when you are angry is the sign of the truest of all good characters. And nothing can be said against a man or a woman who has never made an enemy in their anger. Amen? I've done it. My wife's done it. My daughters have all done it. My, my sons have all done it. We're, hoggards are good at making people upset because we're angry. That's the truth. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. This would be good for husbands and wives. Something Lisa and I have worked on for years. Not going to bed. Okay? We're going to put this away. Okay? And it has to start with one of you putting it away. Because if both of you have to jump in bed with it, it's not going to get settled. Okay? Verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. You know what that means? Your ears are a place. Don't listen to the devil. Don't let him have this place here. Okay? Your eyes are a place. Don't let him stand here. Okay? Your hands and your flesh is a place. Don't let him have them. Okay? Your mouth is a place. Don't let him control your tongue. 
Oh, excuse me. He already does have God take his place. You'll read what the Bible says about the tongue. Okay? The worst baby-making fornicator of North St. Louis has got nothing on a Baptist with a loose tongue. It's the truth. Amen? Neither give place to the devil. Get him out of your mouth. Get him out of your tongue. Get him far away from your language, from your voice, from your words. Verse 28. Let him that stole, unless it's a movie or a song you really like off the internet. Oh, it doesn't mean that either? Now, now you guys know why that I give away my videos for free. Because if I didn't, you guys would all be thieves stealing them from me. I'm not joking. Because I know too many people in, in church. I, listen, all I know is saved people, church, church people. That's all I know. But I know they like to steal movies and videos and songs and everything else off the internet. Steal them. I don't care if you think they've got those songwriters got enough money. If they have enough money, it's probably because they're worldly singers. And what are you doing stealing their music to begin with? Uh huh. I'm catching somebody. I know I am. Okay? I'm just pretending that they're all behind the camera. If you want, if a song is worth having, pay for it. Pay for it. They're only 99 cents a piece. 99 cents is nothing to pay for a song. Not nowadays, it's not. Not nowadays. That's change out of the couch that you can come up with. Buy something, okay? Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor. So we can't preach like that anymore, can we? Working with his hands the thing which is good, which goes back to the idle mind is the devil's workshop. If you'll work with your hands and busy yourself in some sort of productive, industrious session then a lot of this stuff, you just ain't got time for it anymore. You're too busy working. Working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he might, that he may have to give to him that need it. So, they were singing at the office that song that she used to really like back in the 70s. Boy, if I just had me a copy of that song. So, you were going to buy it. You're going to do the right godly thing and buy it. And then God got convicted you a little bit and said, you know, I took that music away from you, what, five times over your life? How many times am I going to keep taking away from you? We used to burn, we used to burn records and tapes out here, preachers' backyard over here. We'd get convicted about stuff. We'd have pe people come down and preach to us and these songs were wrong. We'd bring them out here and burn them in the backyard. Okay? That's why we used to do things. Can't do this stuff anymore. Who has records and tapes anymore? It's all electronic. It's hard to burn electrons. Okay? So I don't know if there's any room for that stuff anymore, but you get convicted about listening to Elvis, get convicted about listening to all this stuff. People used to, my thing was Elvis back when, when he died. I wanted to revive him. Okay? But you just get convicted about his stuff. You don't want that stuff around anymore. You get rid of it. Okay? So work with your hands. That instead of spending that money, downloading that album that you shouldn't have been listening to begin with, why don't you give that away to somebody who really needs it? That's good, amen? Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Corrupt communication, number one, comes in the form of deceit, lie. Number two, it comes in the form of taking God's name in vain. Okay? Number three, it comes in the form of using words that are foul or discriminatory or um, just flat out evil, vulgar, in every sense of the word. Okay? You, listen, you will not have the, um, the urge to pronounce that stuff if that stuff has stopped going in you. 
Okay? We go to these basketball games, and I'll listen to some of them songs they'll play as those guys are warming up. And I am, I, I am shocked. Because I don't listen to stuff. And every now and then, when it comes across something, I'm listening to it, and I'm just going, did he just say the F word in that? Are you kidding me? They sing that stuff now? <clears throat> what would make a church mad is if I printed out in the church bulletin the words to the top five rap songs. If I printed that in the bulletin, that'd make a church mad, right? Why would they get mad then when their kids listen to it? Ain't right. But not corrupt, so it's vulgar words. It's lying words. It's um, vicious words. Vicious words. Prideful words. Arrogant words. But, um, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Before it comes out of your mouth, Run it by this filter right here. Is this going to minister grace to whoever's listening to me? And if it doesn't meet that filter, shut up. Amen? Shut up. Um, where else? I was, going, I was going somewhere else with that too. Probably God doesn't want me to say it. Verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Here's the thing. God has sealed you. Okay? Which means he's decided, I'm not going to break my promise to him. Which means you're locked in with God. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit who's decided to never give up on you. You bring a lot of grief to him. It's like, it's like you marry a wife and you marry a husband and you say, you know, I, I know the world. I know the world doesn't like him. I know what everybody else says about him. But he's my husband he's, or she's my wife and, and I love her and, and I'm just, I'm never going to give up on her. But you can bring that loved one a lot of grief because they have decided to long suffer with you. Don't take their long suffering as a license for you then to keep doing and living the way you're living and to keep talking the way you're talking and acting the way you're acting. Amen? I mean, we love you here at Bethel Church. We want you to feel welcome here. We want you to feel loved here. We want you to feel appreciated here. We want you to feel at home when you come into this place. And so we have decided as a church that we're not going to leave you, nor forsake you. We're going to love you. And we're going to long suffer with you. But that doesn't mean that you have to go out and take advantage of everybody in that church and their good nature and then grieve them over the way you're doing. We had a, a family. Just to give you an example. We had a family years ago, and I still love them, but I got weary of them. Was they run into a little bind one time. We help them pay a bill. Okay? Because I'm, I'm all for that. It's your church people. You take care of them first. But it just seemed like they were often in a bind. And then I would sit down and talk to the guy for a while. And he would brag now about the fact that he didn't have to work every day. His wife went out work. That didn't sit well with him. That didn't sit well with him. You know, here it is, your church's good nature to help you pay your bills. Let their daughter come to our school without paying anything. And then you have the audacity to not, not just brag to me, but brag to everybody that you know about how your wife has to go out and work and the church helps pay your bills, but you don't do anything. And that didn't set well with me. And what they did was they would make this church grieve over their actions. Okay? So, when they finally got mad and left, then we're the bad guy. Oh, you should have seen how they treated us! Really? I have had that happen a lot here. Okay? If you got problems, you got problems. Everybody's got problems. 
okay? Your church is here to help you out. We're here to we're love you. We're going to long suffer with one another. We're going to forbear with one another. We're going to be with each other till the Lord comes back. That doesn't mean you have to go out and deliberately make your church family grieve over you. And what's going on in your life? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed on the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger. I could stop at bitterness right here and say, you go home and pray about bitterness for a while. You pray about who you're mad at. You pray about who you're not happy with. You pray about all the people that have done you wrong. You pray about you being in bondage to what they did to you. You can remain bitter. And then bitterness will always lead to wrath, will it not? And anger and clamor and evil speaking. Put this away from you. All malice. Take all malice, all maliciousness you have in your heart towards somebody and get, it, get rid of it. You don't have time for that. But the truth of it is, I know people that they just don't feel like they're satisfied in life until they're mad at somebody or bitter with somebody. They're always, Jared, a perpetual victim of what everybody does to them. Even when you get saved and become a child of the living God, those are some of the things that God wants to do away with out of a Christian person's life. Verse 32. Be kind to one another. Kind. Tenderhearted. Brokenhearted. Forgiving one another. Even as, see that word as? That is a dual transaction. Right? Dual transaction. Dual transaction means that John owes Sterling 50 bucks, Sterling owes me 45 bucks, and I know Orion 40 bucks. So John pays Sterling. But Sterling then must pay me. But then, I must pay you. So John, why don't you give Sterling five bucks, give me five bucks, and just take that money and give it to him. Because that's how it's supposed to work, right? That is, a, that is as. That's what that means here. Be kind to one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as. God, for Christ's sakes, hath forgiven. That's not the first place that's written in the Bible, is it? Is there a double witness to that? Lord's Prayer. So I'm not wrong in telling you this. I'm not wrong in telling you that if you want your sins, sins forgiven, you better start forking it out Amen. to somebody that you have, un, have not forgiven. So, you need to be forgiven. And they need to be forgiven. So as you forgive them, God forgives you. And then everybody slates clean. At the end of the day, now, all three of us are paid up and prayed up. For all four of us. The four of us here. We're all four paid up and prayed up and ready to go. Don't owe any debts? Didn't leave anything out, did we? Are we good? Amen. Okay? So, these are things that some people may not understand. That being saved and, and, and coming to church and being part of a church. These are things that are the necessary things. Things that God expects out of us. Things that we're told by our chief apostle to do. Paul tells us to do this. We have to do these things. Paul's in authority over us. And if the one who is in authority over us tells us to do these things, then we can't go to God on a side door deal and say, God, Paul said this, but I don't think I think I think me and you had our deal going long before Paul ever came along. So what would just be between me? God would say, no, go see Paul. Okay? Learn these things. There's other lists in your New Testament about things that we're supposed to be doing. Learn those things. 1 Thessalonians 5, there's a whole other list of things there that we should be doing, things we should not be doing. Okay? Galatians chapter, Galatians chapter uh, 5 is another one because that's where it gives the fruits of the Spirit, but it gives 
The works of the flesh. There's 18 things there that we're not supposed to have anything to do with. Not to, supposed to be a part of those things. We've lost. We've forgotten those things. We, for, we don't preach those things. We don't talk about those things. We don't study up on those things. And I think we need to every now and then. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. It's okay for me every now and then to preach God's mercy and grace and goodness and all that good stuff that makes us feel good on Sunday morning, but don't think that I've forgotten the other stuff that we've got to work on. If we're going to be a church that has anything to do for the glory of God, and if we say that we want 2018 to be a year that we want God to save souls, Let's give them something worth being saved to at the end of the day. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless not your word today. Lord, it's only your people that can handle this. Lost people and tea and cookie Christians, Lord, they don't handle it. They don't like it. They don't want it. They want the salvation. They want the grace. But they don't want the lifestyle that goes with it. God, teach us. Teach us the easy way or teach us the hard way. Lord, it doesn't matter. You're going to teach us no matter what. Teach us how to live. Teach us how to be right with you. Teach us how to be right between one another. Teach us how to be right in our own homes. How dads ought to be. How moms ought to be. How children ought to be. God, these are just simple things, Lord, that I've, you've had to teach me over the years and you're still having to teach me. Things that I've learned. Things that I knew were right. So God help us Lord to teach it to this generation. And to the generation that comes. Until you come back and Lord make it to where we don't have to learn these things anymore. We're not there yet. So God show us what it takes. So honor your word. We praise you in Jesus name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.